Every time you leave your home, you go to work, you go shopping, you pass cameras, CCTV cameras more specifically, road cameras catching speeding drivers. Cameras are everywhere. Now imagine over 100 years ago when the technology just wasn't there, but it was at the very beginning of the film industry. This today, my friends, is the story of Mitchell and Kenyon. So we're here back in Blackburn Old Cemetery on the hunt for the grave of James Kenyon. And he was one of a partnership which included another man called Sagar Mitchell. Now together, Mitchell and Kenyon produced over, I think it was 800 mini or short films that captured the hearts of not only the working class people in the northwest of England, but they captured sporting events, newsworthy events. They produced short films um, but it's here in Blackburn where they both worked and lived. They had premises over in a place called Northgate, and I'll show some photographs later on in this video. But uh, together, like I said, they produced over 800, I think it was, short movies. Now, together, they were at the very start, the very beginnings of what would become known as, obviously, the movie industry as we know it today. These guys were at the very, very beginnings. They were pioneers. Now, back in the day, obviously, you didn't have editing software, you didn't have cameras and the equipment we have today. So, yes, it was very basic. But what they captured in those videos, in those short films, they're historical in every nature of the sense. You can look back at them now. You can see fine details in each and every video that they did. And as we go towards James Kenyon's grave, we'll talk more about some of these videos and how this partnership formed and eventually dissolved. So the thing is with the Mitchell and Kenyon films, or short films, was that they were usually taken in one shot. Like I said, there was no editing as such back in the day. So everything was done in one clear shot. The cameras were also fixed they weren't moving around at the time so basically they had a tripod they had the camera on top and they just recorded what was directly in front they never moved the cameras around like what we can do with modern technology but more importantly nearly all of the videos that they shot contained hundreds of people this was done on purpose it wasn't done just for a gimmick effect or you know, for a dra dramatization or anything like that. This was done purposefully. Because what we have to remember is, both Mitchell and Kenyon were savvy businessmen. And each and every person that was captured in those videos, in those short films, was a potential customer. <laughs>
So Mitchell and Kenyon, who were they? Well, Sagar Mitchell, he was a, a well-known businessman in Blackburn, as was James Kenyon. But Mitchell himself, he was a keen photographer and he'd taken photographs of people in his own shop in the centre of Blackburn. As for Kenyon, he used to build, I think he used to build what was called penny in the slot machines. And he used to travel throughout England selling these novelty gaming machines, if you will. But fate combined with luck, you could say, brought these two chaps together. And they, could, they would, like I say, be at the forefront of the short film industry back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. But within a couple of years of forming a partnership, they created their own company, and I think it was called Norden, and I'll spell it down below. And Norden themselves, or the company itself, would expand dramatically. Like I said, they started out filming workers finishing their shift at work. But then they went on to sporting events and other important events that were occurring back in the day. Now we do have one story of them capturing a truly rememberable or memorable event I should say. And that is a football match between Burnley that took place over at Tuff Moor. And it was the season, the first season after Newton Heath had formally changed the name to Manchester United Football Club. So the match between Burnley and Manchester United, as they were now known, took place at Turfmore, like I said, on the 6th of December 1902. And as you can see from the grainy footage, I think Burnley are playing in the lighter coloured strip, with Manchester United playing in, I think it was a dark red strip at the time, but it was the first season that the club of Manchester United were playing after they changed the name from Newton Heath. Now Manchester United went on to win that match 2-0. But the actual footage of that match was supposed to have been shown, I think it was in one of the clubhouses at Turf Moor. Um, but because of the result, because Manchester United actually got beat 2-0, or I should say Manchester United beat Burnley 2-0, Mitchell and Kenyon decided against showing that footage. Now, I can only think that was because, obviously, the local team Burnley had just been beaten and they didn't want to upset, obviously, the fans and obviously it could lead to possible trouble. I don't know, nobody quite knows. But that short film had been hidden away for well over 100 years. And it was uncovered when many other short films of Mitchell and Kenyon were found discovered in a cellar whilst renovation work were going on in one of the old stores or the old shops that they once owned over 100 years ago. Now, the actual film archives or the films that Mitchell and Kenyon filmed, quite a few of it or quite a lot of them can be found on the BFI website and I'll put a link down below. You can also see quite a lot of the footage on YouTube itself just by searching for Mitchell and Kenyon. But the actual footage and the actual tapes that have been obviously released to the public domain, if you will, they'd been hidden for well over 100 years, like I said, in one of the actual stores that uh, Mitchell and Kenya once owned in Northgate. Now, three canisters, they look like milk churns from all accounts, had been discovered in the cellar of one of the premises. And it was during demolition work and the subsequent removal of the debris and the rubbish these three milk churn kind of cylinders were found and they were sealed. Now when they were opened up, they contained, each, each churn contained many, many tapes, or not tapes, but reels, if you will. Nobody knew what to do with them. And I think it was a local historian called Peter Warden, or Warden, I'll put his name down below. He took control and possession of these tapes, but he realized the importance of them pretty much instantly. He realised that these were historical documents. They documented something that had long been and gone. He also realised that these reels were highly volatile and they could ignite pretty quickly. And if one went up, the whole lot goes up, losing obviously all this important history. 
So he put them in the freezer and he froze them, I think, until around 2000 or 2002 when he got in touch with the BFI. Now, all these reels now are safe and secure at some institute or library that the BFI own. And painstakingly, they are now transferring them, they're digitising them, as you can see by going on YouTube or the BFI website. But yeah, it, again, it's all fate, it's all pure chance that these reels were discovered. I mean, they could quite easily have been just thrown away. And I think they were, I think they ended up going to some waste disposal site, but word got back to Peter Ward and about them. But just to think that these could have been so easily destroyed. And even when they were rescued, they were so volatile that the slightest spark and the whole lot would have gone up. So we have to thank Peter Warden for his knowledge and his, his quick thinking in making sure that these reels wouldn't come to any harm. Because well, like I said, we would have lost all this fantastic history that Mitchell and Kenyon had preserved all those years ago. At the very start, I mentioned that the Mitchell and Kenyon films always showed, or always seemed to show, a lot of people in front of the camera. And when you look at the actual footage of a lot of these videos, you will see a lot of young lads, a lot of young girls coming out of the mills. The lads will be shaking the flat caps in the air, swinging them around. You'll see a lot of elderly people stood there staring directly at the camera. And like I said, there's not just one or two, there's hundreds of people. Now, I did say that there were there were savvy businessmen, Mitchell and Kenyon, and they realised that every single person on those short films was a potential customer. So why the potential customers, you might be thinking? Well, basically, what they did during the filming of these short films, they would hand out posters and leaflets, or they'd hand them out shortly after. The people who knew they were on camera, it was a novelty back then, it was, it was a new technology. It was something to behold, if you will. And all these people who knew, who knew they'd been caught on camera would pay money to watch themselves in the local halls, school halls, um, traveling fairgrounds. You have to remember there were no cinemas back in the 1900s. There wasn't a single cinema. The word cinema, I don't think even existed back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So all the, these short films that Mitchell and Kenyon filmed would be shown, like I said, in these other places. Now, if you're in Blackburn and you've just come out of a mill and you knew that you were being recorded and then that footage was being shown in a local school hall or a town hall or, like I said, a travelling fair, I would want to pay. I'd, I'd want to pay a shilling or whatever it cost at the time to go and see myself on the big screen. And Mitchell and Kenyon knew this for well. Every single person that they filmed in all of their videos was effectively a paying customer. Now for those who regularly watch our videos, you may well notice this little incline here with the sign at the very top, just round about, I think it's round about here. The George Dewhurst grave is to the left just behind those bushes and this is the last video I did, which was obviously last, last week. Unbeknownst was at the time, James Kenyon's grave and the chap we've come to see today was literally just over here. This is how close we were to him and we didn't realise. So Vicky says, without the snow we probably would have seen him. But here he is, James Kenyon. Just one part of the Mitchell and Kenyon partnership. This, this fella here was indeed a true pioneer for his time. And as you can see, the friends of Blackburn Old Cemetery are keeping this well maintained and fair play to them. And there is a short plaque, a small plaque I should say. Moving picture pioneers, James Kenyon, Established partnership with Sega Mitchell in 1897. Local films for local people. Street scenes filmed by day shown that night.
on the front of his final resting place in loving memory of and then when we go around the side you've got James Kenyon born 26th of May 1850 died 6th of February and I think it's 19 I think it was 1926 is it the numbers come off it's either 26 or 27 but again I'll put his the years down below but yeah this is the final resting place of James Kenyon part of the Mitchell and Kenyon partnership Now on the opposite side, it says, also Elizabeth, wife of James Kenyon, born April 3rd, 1851, died January 16th, 1931. So his wife is also interred here alongside him, which I think is pretty nice. So the best way to get to James Kenyon's final resting place, if anybody's interested, is if you come through the main gates right at the front, just off Wally Road, just park up, walk up the incline, take a right, and then you'll find yourself coming up this pathway here behind these headstones. Come around to your left. In front of you, obviously, you'll see this green patch and there's a bench with a memorial marker just over there. But if you come around, to your left you'll see signs for the George Dewar's grave which goes up the hill but to your left and about what one two three three headstones or graves graves up you'll see James Kenyon just on your left here so a straightforward to find on a day like this when there's no snow and frost so yeah if you're ever interested and I'll put a map over the top of this anyway showing the location but that is where Mr Kenyon is interred. Now as for the films themselves, they are remarkable. I mean, I watched quite a few in the last couple of weeks leading up to today making this video. And there's one in particular that stood out. And there's also, oh, there was a documentary that came out around 2005 and BBC One had a three part series. And I think it was called The Lost World of Mitchell and Kenyon or The Lost Tapes of Mitchell and Kenyon. But if you look on YouTube, you'll, you'll be able to find them. Now, it was whilst watching that documentary, and I've seen the actual footage in its entirety since, but there's one footage where it shows millworkers coming out, and I think it's the Bush Williams or Bush something factory workers. Again, I'll put it all down below. Um, but it shows all these millworkers coming out. Majority are all men, young boys and young adults, if you will. There's an image of a girl walking in between this group of men and literally guys there's hundreds and hundreds of men coming out and yet this one girl appears and she stares at the camera now obviously mitchell or kenyon or both are behind that camera but she's staring directly at you the viewer as she slowly makes her way forwards and then she disappears out of shot to our right hand side or her left hand side and then obviously she's forgotten for all eternity. But Mitchell and Kenyon have captured that moment and it will be forever there. It's on tape, it's on the internet, it's on the World Wide Web, if you will. Um, but she will now always be seen by people who are interested in this kind of film, if you will, if this kind of history. They've captured a moment. But when you watch it, and I'll put it over the top of here, it's quite haunting. She stares for so long at you, the viewer, or the camera. And it's just a constant stare. But these are the images Mitchell and, and Kenyon captured. Unbeknownst to them at the time, their videos, obviously, they wouldn't have known at the time that these would have stood the test of time, I wouldn't have thought. Like I said, the reels were highly volatile. But they have been captured, and they have stood the test of time. And this young girl, who nobody will probably know anything about was captured and I'll put it over now guys and you tell me what you think of this footage
So that was the grave of James Kenyon here at Blackburn Old Cemetery. We're now going to go over to Mellor, and I think it's St Mary the Virgin Church, or graveyard, uh, and we're going to go and look for the grave of Sagar Mitchell, who was the second half of the partnership of the Mitchell and Kenyon firm, which was known as Norden. And whilst we're there, we'll talk a bit more about the videos and talk about one or two more in particular. But uh, yeah, it's an interesting story on how these two guys were pioneers. They weren't the first people to to make silent movies, by the way. There was, a, I think it was a French guy who started maybe a year or two before them. But Mitchell and Kenyon, because of what they captured, the moment in time, a glimpse on, in history, they will become, obviously, over the, these last few years, they've become more and more prominent, more and more famous, historically, factually. What they captured, I keep saying it, it was a glimpse in time. They captured, you know, everyday people just leaving the mills. A lot of them covered in oil and dirt and grime, sweat pouring from the, the brows. You know, these are the type of images they've captured. And it's the type of images that we all assume it would have looked like in Victorian and then the war in England back in the day. You know, so when you read the books and you watch movies, we know that pretty much what is you know what we see now in recent films, modern films, is pretty much accurate. And a lot of that can be thanked, or it can be tailored towards thanking Mitchell and Kenyon, because without their type of films, I suppose it, you could argue it was kind of guesswork. We have photographs, I get that. Uh, from back in the day, but these videos, the moving pictures, they are videos, they, they're, they're films. So we, we, we can see in great detail exactly what life was like back 1800s, early 1900s. It's fascinating. You just need to go on YouTube and search Mitchell and Kenyon. So we've made our way over to Mellor and St Mary the Virgin. We haven't got a clue where Sagar Mitchell's final resting place is, but we do know he's here and we do have a photograph. So it's just a case of looking now, and in doing so, we'll uh, we'll continue with the story of Mitchell and Kenyon. And as you can see, there's quite a lot of headstones for us to uh, to go through today. Now, the films that we've already spoken about are the short movies of Mitchell and Kenyon. As I said, the majority of them shows a lot of people coming and going from either the place of work or a sporting event or some other historical event. But they're also known for doing short movies, not of, how can I word it? Movies not based on mill workers and like I said, sports, but they did movies based on topical events. So we had an instance, didn't we, where English people, English men were going to Africa in the Boer War. And Mitchell and Kenyon knew this was an opportunity themselves. And I know it might sound a little bit grim and a little bit hard, but they knew that this was an ideal opportunity to cash in. So what they did, they started making what was called fake war movies, short stories on reenactments of what was going on in Africa and the Boer War. Now the thing is, they couldn't afford themselves to travel abroad to make these films. They couldn't pay people to travel abroad to make these films. So what they did, they took the equipment into the Yellow Hills, as they're called, or, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, but it's either Billing or Billinge Woods in Blackburn. And it was there that they'd make these films, these fake war films. But they were extremely popular. Uh, people used to go to the, the town halls, the school halls, the fairs, like I said, to watch these, these short films. But yeah, um, they used to make what was called fake war movies simply because they couldn't pay themselves or anybody else to go to Africa or any other part of the world, that is, to, uh, to make such stories. So Vicky's found it quite quickly. The final resting place of Sagar Mitchell. 
the second of the Mitchell and Kenyon partnership and here he lies but unfortunately his name has been covered so no Sagar yeah there you go Sagar oh, right. is that his dad then? I think so Vicky's just spotted that it's obviously got a lot more names on but uh, as you can see Sagar Jones Mitchell who died October the 2nd 1952 And I think Annie Eliza Mitchell was Sagar's wife. I could be wrong, but I'm sure it is. She died in April the 11th, 1947, in her 78th year. Um, but yeah, this is the final resting place of the famous Sagar Mitchell, just one of two of the Mitchell and Kenyon movie pioneers. Now I'm not sure what it says, until the day break and the shadows flee away. What I kind of find sad about the headstones that we've seen today is that these Sagar Mitchell and James Kenyon they were pioneers of the film industry. These were the two guys, along with obviously other people from around the world, but these were the two guys who were at the very beginnings of the movie industry, if you will. And without people like this, we won't have your Netflixes, your Amazon Primes, your View Cinemas. You won't have your Universals, you won't have Hollywood. You won't have all of what we have and take for granted today. And yet, hidden away in these cemeteries with ivy growing over the headstones, you know, it's like they are being slowly forgotten. And that's why I'm glad we me and Vicky and other people who do similar videos of this on for YouTube, we document lives of these people and hopefully their names will live on forever. They were true pioneers. For those who have seen the Mitchell and Kenyon films, and they are always silent, they always show people seemingly happy, even the workforce coming out of the mills, the factories, they all look cheerful. Now, a lot of the videos were staged. You had Mitchell himself and you had Kenyon who were directing people on what to do prior to filming. But there's one film in particular, and again, it shows a group of lads going into some building and one of them actually curses towards the camera and he sticks the Vs up. Now, is this the very first captured moment in video and film history of somebody swearing in front of a camera i don't know but um it's a note and i will show it over here now it's not too offensive so i'll put it over but as you can see the chap in question is looking towards the cameraman and then he sticks his v's up now there's other bits of footage such as that which is interesting which if, it, if we look in, in, into detail there's another piece of footage where it shows a chap walking down um, he's coming out of work and he's walking out cobbles but it looks like he's got rickets his knees are bent at strange angles but that again captures the moment and what the workers looked like and lived like back in the day and there's other 
bits of footage similar to it. Like I said earlier, you've got the young lads coming out of work, swinging their caps around in the air to grab attention because they knew that they were being filmed. But like I said, these movies waned around about the 1910s, 1920s, early 1920s, and people weren't as interested. The strange thing is, I suppose it's like nowadays, isn't it? When the internet first came out, and you know we were all new to it, everybody who could afford broadband or dial-up, if you will, back in the very beginnings of the internet, it was a novelty. We all wanted to be on the net, the World Wide Web. Even though it was in its infancy, it was a novelty, and we all loved it. We take it for granted now, don't we? Each and every one of us takes life for granted. We take the technology that we use for granted. I'm holding a GoPro that Vicky kindly bought me for Christmas, the new GoPro. I take it for granted that I am using it to record this story for you guys. Most people carry mobile phones or cell phones if you're in America, but most people carry these devices with video and equipment built into it. A camera built into it. We take it for granted. We leave our homes, as I said right at the very start of this video, CCTV footage is everywhere. Mobile speed cameras are everywhere. We take this technology for granted. Back in the day, 1900, Mitchell and Kenyon, I keep saying it, they were at the forefront of the movie industry. They didn't have the software to edit and to place together the films like we have today. Again, I take it for granted. But when we look back at the videos and what they captured, it was truly magnificent. It was really, really... It was important as well what they did because without them, like I said, when we're at Sago Mitchell's grave, without these type of guys, these pioneers, would we have Hollywood? Would we have services such as Netflix and Amazon Prime and Play and things like that? Would we have, would we have these today without pioneers? I highly doubt we would. It's a really interesting subject and I do hope you guys have, have enjoyed this video today. Now, as I've said during the video, you can find these videos of Mitchell and Kenyon on YouTube. Um, now, what you might notice is some of it has been colorized. When they were originally made back in the 1800s, 1900s, they were obviously in black and white. And as I've said, they were silent short movies. So there was no music, there was no sound. Uh, but yeah, if you do come across the colorized ones, they are brilliant, don't get me wrong, they are fantastic. And what these people do to colorize them, it's amazing, it blows my mind what they do. But bear in mind that the originals were in black and white. Um, still fascinating all the same. I mean, it still shows what went on back in, obviously, 1800s, 1900s, England. So yeah, check them out. Check out Mitchell and Kenyon. Just look for them on YouTube, guys, and uh, you, you'll come across this, this footage. So just like at Blackburn Old Cemetery, for anybody interested in looking into the story of Mitchell and Kenyon, if you come to Mellor and St Mary the Virgin Parish Church, come through the gates and where the actual church itself is in front of you if you follow the path round and say God's grave is literally just round about here where these bushes are they probably won't be here all the time obviously but he's just there so I'll do a walk through so if we go through the actual gates and make our way to the right and just keep on walking round And then just go onto this bit of a dirt path here. Keep going right. And he's literally a couple of feet down. And he's just here. The final resting place of Sagar Jones Mitchell. So Mitchell and Kenyon, they worked together and it wasn't for many years to be honest. I think it was 20 at max. But eventually, and it was at the eve of, I think it was the First World War, but on the eve, the films themselves weren't getting as many views. People weren't going watching what they were filming. It was like the interest had waned. And eventually, I think it was around about 1922, both Sagar, Mitchell and James Kenyon dissolved the partnership. Now, I think it was amicable. I don't think there was anything untoward. But they knew there, was, there wasn't much money left in, the, in what they were doing. And they were being kind of left behind by the more prominent American filmmakers. And we have to remember that Mitchell and Kenyon 
were making short movies at least 10 years before the likes of Charlie Chaplin. So this is how basic things were back in the time. It's a truly fascinating story. Um, and I, you know, you guys, if you're interested, please do some of your own research on it because there's a lot more that obviously I've not even touched upon. But if you did like this video, you did like the story and the locations where we visited, don't forget to give us a big thumbs up. Don't forget to comment down below. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. There's always more videos coming. But in the meantime, as I always say, from Mellor and St. Mary the Virgin, take care guys, look after yourselves, and we will be back soon with another tale from my dark but illustrious past. Take care guys.